Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we're taking you through the best bits of Selling the Invisible by Harry Beckwith, a field guide to modern marketing. When this was written in 1997, three quarters of Americans worked in service companies. Now, in 2020, that's up over 80%. More than four out of five people are working in service companies. If you think about it, services are not products and service marketing is not product marketing. A product is tangible. If you think about you buy a Mars bar, you pick it up, you can see it, you can touch it, you can taste it. A service is intangible. When you go get your tax done by your local accountant or something, you're really buying something that doesn't exist. You can't kind of see the product in the same kind of way as your as your Mars bar. So while four out of five uh, people are working in service companies, uh, if you look at the business school MBA case studies, less than one out of five are about services. They're all about products. So everybody is thinking about how do you market your products, but service marketing is totally different. You need to come with a totally different attitude. So in the case of the service marketing, it's left unseen. So this is where the title comes from, selling the invisible. So selling the thing that can't be seen because services, they rarely come with a standard price tag. It's not like how you walk into the store when you're looking to buy a jacket and you see it, you know, costs 150 bucks or something and you know exactly what you're getting and you know what you're paying for. Very different if you're speaking to a carpenter to renovate your kitchen. Yeah, if you think about an example like that or like a financial planner who's going to, going to come and review your company's pension policy or you think about a caterer who's going to come and provide food for your 60th birthday party, you don't know exactly what you're going to get. You don't know exactly what it's going to go and cost. Normally, you get the... You, you do like a bit of an initial chat and then they'll say, oh, let me go away and I'll work up a, an estimate or I'll, I'll give you a bit of a, a quick proposal. At that point, you're thinking, oh, crap, how much <laughs> is this going to cost me? Because services don't come with that standard price tag. You never really know what it's going to cost or what you're going to get. For services, you really don't know when it doesn't work either and it's not as clear as it is for the product. So if you're driving your car and your stereo conks out, then you think, all right, it's broken. I mm. need to go buy a new one. Or if your clutch stops working or if the milk tastes like ass or anything like that, you know the product's wrong. But for a service, it's very hard to tell. You know, If you're paying an accountant to get some advice on your tax, it's really hard to know if that advice was any good or not, if the advice could have been better or if it was if you knocked it out of the park. You never really know. The same as like if you think of a consultant who comes in to give you some consulting advice, mm. it's very hard to put a value on was that any good or not. Well, absolutely. When you think about the my tax return I just did recently, my accountant whipped up something pretty pretty beautiful. I was like, I was thought, thinking he was getting a big whack and have to pay a lot of money. I ended up getting money in return. Well, like, that's pretty fantastic. But it's hard to know where that sits compared mm. to all the other accountants. There might be even better accountants out there, but you know those sort of things, tangible results are left unseen. The other thing is you, with products, when you buy a product, you know you're buying something you know, not human and you think if it conks out and you, you know there was just a fault with that product, you don't really blame anybody or anything. You just think, oh man, this one didn't work. I'll get a new one. Whereas with a service, you're generally dealing with a, a person. There's like a human connection there. So when it doesn't go according to plan, it feels like something personal. You think this person had something against you or they hated you or how could they do something to me to ruin my business? If someone does a shit job, it just feels that much worse if it's a service. So everything is moving away from products and towards services. So if you're marketing in the new economy, you've got to start thinking like a service marketer. So as a service marketer, doctors, architects, dry cleaners, accounting firms, brokers, tradesmen, engineers, marketing agencies, and so forth, you're going to face prospects almost shaking with worry. They're sensitive to make the mistake they're about to make. So what marketing must start with is this understanding, an understanding of the worried souls you're going to be dealing with every single day. And you need to learn to focus less on the features and benefits of the actual service offering and start understanding a lot more about the power of their perceptions of the offering. And the little twist here is that obviously there's 80% of people who are working in services and they need to market their services, but also the other 20% that are working products. People want more of a service aspect as well. You're, not, you're no longer just buying the software product, you're buying the support and the coaching and the, the advice and recommendations that come along with that. So products are now getting services coupled in with them as well. Or even if you think about the, the cafe, you're not going to the place with the best coffee or you're not going to the pub with the best beer, the, you're buying not just the product itself, but all of the services that come along with that product. Yeah, where we get our morning coffee, it's not just about the, the coffee, it's about other things, the smiling and the pleasantness, I'd say, of the, uh, the waitresses and the baristas. So in this episode, we're going to be delving deep into the three most important aspects of service marketing. We'll be looking at the importance of the service itself, perceptions, 
positioning, and finally, how to price effectively. One day, all the way back in 1993, the author of this book walked into Dayton's suit department store where they'd promised that they were going to have his brand new summer lightweight suit repaired and ready for him by that afternoon. When he came back, the young store clerk, Big Rog, Roger Azam, his name was, the executive said to him, hey, I'm here to pick up my suit. Roger went out back to check and said, "Ah, oh, sorry, it's just not ready yet. The executive, he was bubbling up inside. He was ready to flip his lid. He was probably going to start hanging shit on Roger and the whole company and saying what a joke it was. But before he could get to that point, Roger recognized there was a bit of frustration with the message he just sent and said, hang on, I'll be right back in just a sec. So when Roger came back a few seconds later, he said, look, sorry, we were a bit sloppy there. We missed your deadline, but we're going to do it right now. Give me five minutes and I promise it'll be done. So in that five minutes of waiting, what the executive did, he started wandering around the aisles, checking out for other sports jackets. He found a big brown Hugo Boss jacket. He absolutely loved it. He decided to buy it for 575 bucks. Rog, he was still at the front. He chimed in and said, look, there's three possible ties that might work with this jacket. And the executive, he grabbed them too, which was another 55 bucks. Plus, he had to buy a new black slacks, which he'd gone down a size. So that was another 110 bucks. So in that time of waiting, he spent a whole lot more money in that store. So what Roger Azam did here, the, the sales clerk, he flipped what was a big error on their part. They didn't meet their promise. They didn't meet their deadline. And he turned that into a positive by rectifying the problem in a massive way by saying, wait right here. We're going to do it right now as you're waiting here. He's now given this opportunity where the bloke thought, oh, this is, that was a very nice thing to do. Mm. Walked around the store, ended up buying a whole bunch more stuff. So what this story highlights is this important note that really we need to improve our service. So we're not just saying that we not we don't just need to market our service in in terms of getting the word out there. We actually just need to improve our service as the first step of service marketing. Yeah, the product was actually the work they did on the suit in that case. The service is actually how the person handled the situation and everything. And in handling it properly and having such a great service, rather than having this whole experience being something negative, it turned into a positive, which was actually more sales. So the greatest misperception about service marketing is that People equate marketing with selling and advertising as pushing the goods. It's this popular view when we think about products, you just got to push it out there and push it down people's throats and marketing just means the hard advertising side of things. But in terms of service marketing, the first step of marketing your service is getting a really bloody good service. So just simply getting the word out about your service isn't enough. You need to focus on improving your service to make it as good as possible before you try to get the word out. So a better service makes everything just downhill skiing from there. The marketing becomes easier, it becomes cheaper, and everything's just more profitable. So the first step in marketing is improving your service. And when, we, when you think about your service, you got to think beyond just the surface level of the transactional thing that you're doing for the customer and think about what are you really selling. So if you think of the fast food business, uh, the burger joints back in the 1950s, they used to think that they were selling food. And then you got McDonald's that came along and figured out people weren't just buying good hamburgers, they were buying the whole experience. They were buying the speed that came with it, they were buying the production line element that McDonald's brought to it, and they were buying that whole experience that went along with it. Burger King, their big competitor, thought it was all about the product, and they think we've got the best burgers, we're flame broiled, we're not fried, and all they were pushing was saying, hey, if you want the best burger, come to us. But very quickly, Burger King realized that it wasn't just about the best burger and that McDonald's, well, they didn't have the best burger, they had the best burger business. Mm, absolutely. 100%. Well, if you think about Macca's, there's a lot better products and burgers. It's and a shocking food. burger. It's a shocking burger. <laughs> Objectively. But they're doing pretty well. And translate this as a metaphor into services. So if you think about most companies in expert services like your lawyer, your accountant, your doctor, your engineer, most people think that the client is buying their expertise. It's all about getting better at your craft and doing what you're exactly doing. But the problem is a lot of the time, the client can't even tell the difference between a good service and a bad service. Take my uh, tax return, for example. There's no way I'll know exactly mm. where it sits compared to everything else. So how the hell can you tell a good accountant from a bad one? Or how can you tell a good not diagnosis from a doctor from a bad one? Yeah, the only thing we can do because none of us are experts in the thing that we're buying the service is we look at proxies. We don't look and think, oh, this is a nice looking tax return versus this is a not so nice tax return. We're looking for other signs or cues or signals that can give us a bit of an insight into how good this person is. So in most professional services, you're not selling expertise. What you're really selling is a relationship. 
Mm. Like Macca's, they weren't selling burgers. They were selling convenience and speed. Expert services, it's all about the relationship you're building. So if you're someone listening right now and you're selling a service, you're actually selling a relationship. Yeah, it's a very important twist. Uh, and you're no longer thinking, how can I be the best possible expert at my craft? It goes a lot deeper than just the service itself and thinking about all the corollary things around the side. If you think about, uh, you know, if someone's pitching for business and they get turned down, then people might say, oh, just the chemistry just wasn't there or we just really weren't clicking with them. It often comes down to these things like I just, I like them. I had a good feeling about them. It feels like a good fit. Service businesses are really just relationships when you boil it down. So, the real way to win in the real world here is through chemistry and relationships. So, it's a matter of feelings and emotions, not about having logic and statistics of why you're the actual best. When you think, uh, you know, during high school, you may have done well in school or not done so well in school, but it's sort of like a different world. You think you go to university, then it's all about the quality of the, the education. You know, you're doing your course, you're trying to get really smart, building your expertise, building your talent, getting really good at what you're doing. So, you think in the real world, people are going to value who's the best at this, who's the best accountant, the best doctor, the best lawyer, the best carpenter. But really, life is actually like high school. Once you finish university, it flips back to high school and it's not at all like university. It's actually all about popularity. The things that made you popular in high school now make you popular in business. Yeah, you might hate it and fight it and argue against it. It's kind of true. I think about construction industry and say you're an engineering firm looking to win a huge contract for say a big billion dollar you know, building or something like that. A lot of people, probably when I started my career, I thought, all right, it's all about being the best engineer, mm. coming up with the best computations and the best design and everything like that. Turns out that's all bullshit. <laughs> it's all about how well you perform on the Friday Arvo beers. <laughs> it's true. Like yeah. <laughs> if you're having lunch with them and you can get along with the developer, you're having beers and you're enjoying it and you're having, cracking some funny jokes and all that, everyone just kind of forgets about your actual ability. Yeah, that's very true actually. I was just thinking back to my, my very first days as an intern at the bank. Uh, I think if you've listened to this podcast before, you will have known that objectively I wasn't a good banker mm. in the sense of the actual work, but I was the, the banker that could get along with the, the senior guys who were going for the Friday long lunches or you could go to the pub after work or you could go to a client meeting and actually talk to somebody and not just be stuck in the numbers and the spreadsheets. And surprisingly, those are the things that actually mattered in the real world. Yeah. It's, it's so true, isn't it? <laughs> Almost uncomfortably true, but that is. Well, it's just it's kind of funny how university, uh, if this is the case, which it is, how much university just doesn't set you up yeah. for the real world where everything is purely about that score you get on a piece of paper, nothing to do with personal relationships at all. So, this is probably the strongest element of the 22 immutable laws of marketing, that marketing is a battle of perceptions, not products. Very similar with uh, services as we've learned. So, if you think about your prospects who's looking to buy, we've got Peggy here, pretty old-fashioned name. I don't know any Peggy's out there. But um, yeah, what she is, she's frightened and you're trying to sell her an invisible thing, an abstract service she has to buy, but she never really knows exactly what value she's going to be getting in her pocket. So, she's uneasy. It's less risky if you think about it for her to just do nothing and just let the service go by and more risky for her to actually buy the services. So, at this point, once you've, once you've explained what you do and what you're going to deliver, the obvious thing is thinking, oh, there's somebody who's scared. There's somebody who's a bit reserved. I need to push on them more. I need to push a little bit harder to get this sale and close the deal. But it's actually not pushing that's going to help. What you need to do at this point is actually reduce the fear. It's much safer, much less risky for Peggy to tell her boss that she did nothing than that she picked the wrong company. She's at the point where fear is driving the decision. So, you need to calm her fear rather than keep hard pushing for that hard sale to close the deal. So, rather than just pushing and pushing and pushing Peggy into closing the sale, you need to reduce the fear and make her feel comfortable in any way you can. For example, you might just scale down the version of the product you're selling. So, not necessarily for free, but just a small enough step for her to actually move towards it. Rather than signing up for a year, for example, you might do a one-month trial or you might just do one uh, very small meeting or something at the very start just to build up her confidence in you. If you think about competition in the service realm, 
Uh, you might think that your competitors are people who are offering similar services to you, but in most cases, that's not true at all. The real competition actually comes from the prospect themselves. Like if you think if you're a, if you're a lawnmower. Uh, you're not really competing against all the other lawnmowers out there. You're competing against a prospect. The prospect has got the choice to either not do anything and let the lawn grow wild or they could do it themselves or they could hire you. So you're not out there trying to beat all the other lawnmowers. You're actually trying to show the, the person that this service is necessary. You're not trying to win a bigger share of the market. You're actually creating the market in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. It's like I think any anyone now trying to sell a one-day seminar on me and you, Asher, or something. It's a very hard sale because where does our brain just go straight to what, what's the book on there trying to sell? <laughs> yeah, and exactly. So they're not just competing against the other people. They're competing against us just not buying their service whatsoever. Same with graduate programs all around the world. They've always got the choice to just not choose anything as an option. Okay, so we've talked about perceptions and we've talked about uh, quelling a, a client's or a prospect's fear and we've talked about how you're not really competing against other competitors, you're competing against doing nothing. There's other things that you can do in terms of perceptions to help make yourself look better as a service provider. We've done so many books on psychology and human behavior that show that we're not rational creatures at all. Things like predictably rational, thinking fast and slow, influence, persuasion. All of these books that we've done show that the human brain is very easily manipulated and we even sometimes trick ourselves. So what we should be doing as service marketers is harnessing some of these things to boost our perceptions in the prospect's mind. One strategy here is saying PM and delivering AM. And this is using the anchoring effect, which we covered in Thinking Fast and Slow. So if you think about it, if you say to the client, you're going to have it to them by at 1 p.m., they're expecting it to come at 1 p.m., then you send it at 11 a.m., mm. they're obviously going to be uh, very pleased with the outcome. If you think about it the other way, if you said 9 a.m. and it comes at 11 a.m., mm. they're going to be pissed off. So just by setting expectations the right way and anchoring them where you want them to be, you can actually change the perception of your service. Yeah, especially the first time you ever do something for a client, you always got to get it in before you say it, even the first few times because then they're going to think, man, this person is a superstar. Whatever you're doing for them, they're going to think, man, that's amazing. So you've harnessed the power of anchoring. Another one is the uh, familiarity effect or the status quo bias. So because of our, you know, our brains are built on caveman days where we didn't like change, we didn't like anything new, a rustle in the bushes, something unexpected. That could be a tiger who's about to jump out and bite your head off or if it's a new tribe coming along, they could have diseases that wipe out your entire culture. So we're very scared of new, we're very scared of change. So as a service marketer, we need to harness the power of becoming familiar and becoming comfortable with that client. Yeah, in the book, it looks at what happens with bad publicity. In the short term, what the prospects look at the company as is obviously a really bad thing or they, they're a shitty company. But over time, they kind of forget about the bad publicity and actually you remember the name. So if you've got two different companies, one that had bad publicity three years ago versus another thing without a name, they're going to choose the one that they know um, before the other one. So getting the word out even through any kind of publicity is a really good thing. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't know if it was intentional or not, but that's something, you know, Donald Trump obviously using the lead up to the 2016 election. He got so much free media and free publicity by getting his name out there. He did a lot of wild shit. Mm. You know, a lot of bad things came up. He was talking about, you know, international trade policies. He was talking about immigration. He was saying all these things that sounded bizarre and outrageous. He was grabbing people by the pussy, and his, <laughs> but his name was just out there so often he got, that he got so much free publicity that all anybody was ever talking about was Trump. Mm. Now, we're not necessarily saying that that's what you should be doing for your <laughs> service business, but we're, but we're saying that uh, it is something to breed familiarity does really help you in the long term. We're not talking about spammy Facebook ads or YouTube ads, or we're not talking about just going around the suburb and dumping your flyer in everybody's letterboxes, but we are talking about doing some of those smaller things to get your name out there. Maybe it's going to those industry networking events. Maybe it is having that, that comfortable social presence that you need to have. It's going to lunches. It's going to meetings. It's going to you know handshakes, doing all these kinds of things to get yourself out there as much as you can to breed that familiarity. Another one we can use is the recency bias. So as we said, clients prefer something that's familiar. If they hear from you at an industry event or something and you're presenting and you've got two options or two different times to follow up, it's going to make a very big difference if you follow up straight away because 
you're still quite recent in the brain compared to following up a lot longer after. So being very quick with your follow-ups makes mm. a very big difference. Vital. And one that seems a little bit counterintuitive but really works in the long term is show your warts. So there was a study at uh, Cleveland State University in the 1980s. They had two fictional characters that they created, Dave and John. They were very similar on paper. They had very similar uh, application uh, cover letters. They had very similar resumes and experience. And they sent out these fake fictional job applications to a whole bunch of different jobs. And there was only one slight difference. In John's reference letter from his previous boss, uh, then his fictional boss said, sometimes John can be difficult to get along with when he sets his mind on an end goal and wants to ensure that it is achieved to the highest level. So it's like a bit of a negative saying John's a bit of a prick to work with sometimes if he's pushing really, really hard. Mm. But if you think, who got more offers? You got the squeaky clean Dave or you've got the sometimes difficult John. Surprisingly, John got all those offers ahead of Dave. And the reason being that was by showing that one wart, it makes everything else seem more believable. If you've got your reference letter that just says, Dave's a legend, Dave's awesome, everything Dave does, he dominates. Mm. It sounds a bit dodgy compared to John who's saying, John's awesome, John dominates. He's a bit yeah. of a prick but he's a very good worker. That just sounds a lot more believable. Yeah, we're not all Jesus Christ. We're <laughs> absolutely perfect. Not even Jesus was perfect. He didn't claim that. So if someone's claiming that they're perfect, then yeah, red flags. Unintentionally, we did. Uh, we opened the last section with 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing by Al Rees and Jack Trout. This one opens up with the other book, Positioning. Mm. And this book is saying that you have to position yourself in the prospect's mind. It needs to be a singular position, one simple message that sets you apart. And now the uncomfortable thing with positioning as one position means you're sacrificing all of the other positions you could possibly have. So if you think about Domino's, who've been a very, very successful pizza business, uh, for years, they never really mentioned any of the things you'd think people will care about a pizza, things like quality, price, and value. All Domino's is about is speed, speed, speed. It's like 30 minutes or it's on us. So they own this distinctive advantage of speed in the pizza delivery business. So if you're sitting there on a Friday night and you get this pang of hunger and you think, oh, I want a really quick pizza, bang, straight away, Domino's is the thing mm. that pops in your brain. You think about there's other moments where you might be sitting there and go, oh, I wouldn't mind a Wednesday night, really high quality pizza with a glass of red. <laughs> Something else who's positioned mm. themselves there will pop straight in your mind. So if you think about it, if you're marketing your service under certain circumstances, you want to be the thing popping in the mind first. So a quick quiz here is what terrifies service marketers most? A suggestion that they must position their service or the shower scene in Psycho. <laughs> now, that, the shower scene is pretty scary, but to a service marketer, positioning as one single position is a hell of a lot more scary. And the fear all comes because standing for one thing means you can't stand for anything else. It's pretty painful to sacrifice. You might think you can be all things to all people. You think, yeah, I can do a bit of A, I can do a bit of B, I can do a bit of C, I can do everything. And you think that's a good position, but that's actually horrible because really you're just nothing then. You're a bit of a nothingness. You need to just pick one thing that is your position and say, this is what I'm really good at. This is my competitive edge. So the goal here is to end up with a position. So you got your objective position about where you're sitting now, but you've also got to target where you want to be. So what they recommend is you do a positioning statement. With that, it's the goal about the direction you want to be heading and occupy what part of the uh, the client's brain that you want. So have a think about things like this. Who are you? What business you're in? Who are you for specifically? What need are you serving? Who else are you against here? And what's different about you to the others? And what's your specific benefit to that? So those are like seven questions that you need to ask yourself and you need to have seven really good answers for them. So when we're creating this positioning statement, when we're answering these questions, we're thinking about how do we wish to be perceived in the prospect's mind. I've got a mate, um, Socko, the Socko effect. We are chatting about this <laughs> recently actually. I hope he doesn't mind me disclosing. But yeah, he's an osteo, hitting 30 years old, very good at what he does, but kind of looking to go towards that niche into doing it specifically for, for golfers. So according to this strategy, it's a very good idea because over time going towards that niche and serving those customers only, people who are golfers will actually seek him out rather than him just being in the, the sea of, of everybody else who's an osteo. 
Or if you think about another example, think of like a, a marketing agency. A marketing agency, there's a lot of things you could do in marketing. You could do TV ads, radio ads, billboards. You could do influencer marketing. You could do social media ads. And if you say to, uh, if you're pitching to a client, hey, we're a marketing agency, we do everything. That's, that's mm. a pretty weak proposition to compare to, hey, we're a marketing agency, but we focus just on one specific thing. Maybe we focus just on digital marketing. We think TV is a waste. We think radio is a waste. We think billboards are a waste. We do this one thing, social media marketing, and we do it really, really well. So yeah. by picking that one specific niche, that one specific positioning statement, it makes you a much more enticing proposition. Absolutely. And it's something that you could probably become the best in the world at or the best in your industry if you narrow it down to a specific niche and in doing that you're going to have a lot more value attached to your service because of the scarcity in what you're actually doing timberland not the rapper (laughs) the shoe manufacturer was struggling in the 1980s they had a good line of boat shoes they were priced slightly below the industry leader top cider You'd think an almost identical product at a cheaper price should mean that they'll be kicking ass. Like, you know, if you've got two products, you just choose the one that's slightly Mm. cheaper for the same quality. But Timberland, what they did was something counterintuitive. They put their prices way up. So in terms of positioning, they were much more expensive than the top cider. And counterintuitively, their sales went through the roof. Very counterintuitive. Uh, another counterintuitive example, this is one that Robert Cialdini talks about in the book, Influence. He speaks about this Native American jewelry store. They had this one line, this turquoise jewelry collection, that even in peak tourist season, they couldn't sell any of them. The owner was getting pretty frustrated. She tried all this sales training for her staff. She was encouraging her staff to push the products a bit harder, but nothing seemed to be working. She was getting frustrated. She thought, oh man, I need to take a weekend off here. She scribbled a little note for the person who was coming in the next day and she stuck it on the turquoise jewelry saying, everything in this cabinet, price slash two. So that's what she wrote and the person came in, they read it the next day uh, and they action what they thought the note said when the owner came in the following monday morning she found that the whole turquoise Mm. jewelry had been sold out and she thought man that was an incredible weekend it must have worked but what she realized was that the the staff member wasn't too good at high school math she saw price slash two she thought they meant multiply by two so Mm. instead of halving the price she doubled the price and when she doubled the price they managed to sell out of all the more expensive stuff yeah very very counterintuitive again kind of ridiculous so you might think that pricing is a simple and logical part of the process so, say if you've got your service, if you just make it cheaper, you think people are going to pile mm. in, but sometimes it's not actually the case. If you think about, yeah, for me, red wine, like I'm not going to spend five bucks on a bowl of red. <laughs> yeah, Maybe when I first start again on it, but I'm not going to spend 50 bucks either. So, there's this narrow range. The product might actually be the same wherever it goes, but I'm actually choosing my, making my decision based on price rather than the actual product. So, when it comes to pricing and pricing your service, it is a very subjective thing. Services especially, it's very hard to put a a dollar value on the value that you're you're offering. When it comes to pricing, a little resistance to your price is actually a good thing. And he says that a good range of resistance is about 15 to 20% of people complaining. If nobody complains about your price then it's too low. Obviously, if everybody's complaining and saying, no, this is too expensive, I'm not going to buy it, that's too high. But somewhere in that 20% range of people who are a little bit uncomfortable, that aren't quite sure if it's worth it, that feel like it's a little bit too expensive, that's actually a very good thing. He says Mm. that pricing is like a screw, a little bit of resistance is exactly what you need. The worst thing you can do with pricing is being in the deadly middle, he calls it. So, the mistake a lot of people do is they go out there and find out what all the competitors are pricing it at. They find the high price and the low price and the going rate and then they just go somewhere in the middle of that spectrum and go, all right, that's pretty reasonable. <laughs> but if you're just picking something in the middle of everyone else, what are you really saying about your service? Are you saying that you're cheaper than the best because you're not as good as the best? Or are you saying that you don't really value your services? So why should they? Yeah, exactly. If you put yourself as the lowest price, you can get a lot of business from everybody who wants to get the cheapest. But the problem with that is that as soon as somebody else cheaper comes along, you lose your customers. If you put yourself in the middle, you're not the cheapest. So, people who want the cheapest aren't going to buy. And if you're not the most expensive, which means you're not the best. So, the people who want the best aren't going to buy. So, the, the strange thing here is that you actually probably need to price yourself somewhere at the top, if not at the top. Mm -hmm. As we said at the start, it's very hard to judge the value of a service. People look for proxies like relationships. Another proxy is price. I think if this is the most expensive, it's probably the best. Mm -hmm. 
So what is a service worth? What's talent worth? Some lawyers, they might charge a thousand bucks an hour to read legal documents. Probably seems like a rip off <laughs> when you cop that bill, right? Consultants, photographers, artists, the value of these services is really subjective and then there's not this real hard, fast rule for pricing. We've got a story here of Pablo Picasso. There was a woman strolling along the streets of Paris. She spotted Picasso in a cafe practicing a few sketches. She walked up to him and said, hey, can you sketch me and then tell me what it's worth and I'll pay you for it. He whips up a quick little sketch. Two minutes later, he hands it over. This woman is holding in her hands an original Picasso and she said, oh man, this is awesome. How much do I owe you? And he said, 5,000 bucks. And she said, what? <laughs> Five grand? It took you like two minutes to draw this thing. And he said, no, no, it didn't take me two minutes. It took me my whole life. Mm, I like it. <laughs> Mate, she, she stuffed up from the very start. You don't, you don't ask for the product and then the price either. You probably add a bit of juice onto it, right, if they do it in that order. But he's absolutely right. He's crafted it away, doing a lot of free hours, probably spending money, investing in mastering his craft. And then she's ex- paying for exactly that. All the pain he went through, mm. especially in those early years, to become the best in the world. So, when you're charging for services, you shouldn't be charging by the hour or by the minute. You should be charging by the years of experience that you've got and the quality that you're giving here. I guess another similar example is that the carpenter equivalent, there was a bloke who had a squeaky floorboard that annoyed him to no end. Eventually, it was squeaking so much that he thought, I need to get a carpenter here. Carpenter walks in, crouches down, looks up and down the floorboard, gives a little push, a little wiggle. 30 seconds later, he gets his nail, bangs it in, three hammers, the creek is gone, it was fixed. Mm. And so, he said, cool, that's 50 bucks, thanks. And the bloke said, mate, that was 30 seconds, what are you doing? (laughs) And so, he he pulled out his little invoice slip and he wrote on it, hammering, $2, knowing where to hammer, $48. I like it. Mate, this is a really good, good book, Selling the Invisible by Harry Beckworth. It's the first sales book we've had specifically targeted at services. It's kind of illuminating. I think one of the biggest takeaways is realizing that if you're in the service business, which is pretty much everyone, Mm. what you're doing really is selling a relationship. So, if you look to invest your resources in what's going to make it the best for the customer, it's actually that relationship you got with them, not necessarily just the service itself. We got a review that came in via Apple Podcasts from Gracie Chops. Personalized summaries, how brilliant. I've bought many book summaries over the years designed to save me time, give me the main points of a book, a really useful service, but this podcast goes so much further. You listen to a conversation with two guys who clearly read a lot, like to talk about books and give more than a summary. If you like reading but prefer audio, this is a podcast for you. Thank you so much, Gracie Chops. Uh, We love reading these reviews. We haven't got any... uh, Thing less than five stars for a while. So if you've got something that we can improve on, let us know as well. Send us an email, podcast at whatyouwillearn.com or at the website, uh, you can hit the contact us button. That's whatyouwillearn.com.